Are we living in a simulation? The simulation theory is one that has gained a lot of momentum in the last 25 years because of movies like The Matrix, Black Mirror, Don't Worry Darling, and Inception, just to name a few, where the main character wakes up only to realize that everything they thought was real was not. So what is the likelihood that you're in a simulation right now? I'm Ashley Christine and here's how it works. The first head-mounted augmented reality display was introduced in 1968 by Ivan Sutherland. It was called the Sword of Damocles, which is an ancient moral parable about a rich and powerful man with a sword over his head which hangs by a thread. A reminder that power is precarious. The headset was too heavy and primitive to be taken seriously. The technology just wasn't there yet. There were a few more attempts in the 80s and Nintendo had the Virtual Boy console in the 90s, but it wasn't really until the Oculus Rift became commercially available in 2016 that a realistic virtual reality headset was in the public eye. But this is all fun and games and only interacts with your visual and audio senses. And then The Matrix was released in 1999 and everyone was like, Wait a minute. I don't usually like to give movies full credit for scientific movements, but The Matrix was a huge success and it had a massive impact on the public imagination in a way that had it come out 10 years earlier, it wouldn't have stuck the same. People began to wonder if the technology was there, how hard would this be? What is reality? Seems like kind of a stupid question, right? Because it's something that we experience every day. We wake up, go to school or work, hang out with our friends, and scroll through TikTok for hours wondering why we haven't accomplished more with our lives. We don't challenge or question the validity of our experiences because we're here, and that seems to be evidence enough for most of us. But what we experience is far easier to alter than what you might think. The world around us has a lot of data, and we need to be able to process that data. Enter neurons. These are the building blocks of your brain, and they transmit signals throughout your body, allowing you to do anything and everything. There are hundreds of billions of these things in your head, each of which can have up to 10,000 connections to other neurons, which means there are as many connections in one cubic centimeter of brain tissue as stars in our galaxy. Most of what your brain is doing is fully automated. Things like the bones in your feet when you walk, your intestines digesting food, and everything you see and hear but don't even notice. The more it can do without being bogged down by the micro micromanaging of your conscious self, the faster it can make decisions in the background to help you avoid danger, reproduce, find food, and everything else we think is primitive but still need to do. The best way I was given to think about it is the United States. Because everything is about us. Try to imagine everything happening in the country. A traffic jam in Minneapolis, a sewer pipe in Manhattan. There is so much going on here in a single moment that you couldn't possibly take in everything. You just want a snapshot, a newspaper to sum up the important events. That newspaper is like your aware self, giving you just those key events. Like, hey, avoid that rock or you'll trip, rather than, hey, there's a small piece of corn in your small intestine, am I good to send it through to the large intestine? We give our aware self credit for everything happening in our brain, but it really only oversees a tiny portion of it. I can show you how oblivious you are. How does your shoulder feel right now? You'll only notice something if it's brought to your attention. If you drive down this street every day to work, you could make it the whole way without remembering a single detail of it. But if a pink squirrel ran across the street, that you'd notice because it's wrong. Your brain wasn't anticipating it. Your mind is making assumptions and predictions like that all of the time. And you may think, ah, you know, I don't like that. I want it to deliver to me raw data only. But then, you wouldn't be able to catch a baseball. Your brain needs to be allowed to make predictions because it's working with limited information. In this example, it's where the ball has been. That's the raw data, but your brain needs to make predictions on where the ball will be so that you can position yourself to catch it. A lion couldn't hunt if its brain couldn't predict motion. As far as the need for assumptions goes, let's say you walk into this library and I give you five seconds to take it all in. You might be able to tell me the number of windows, that the floor has a large rug, but you couldn't tell me the color on the spine of every book. This is because your mind makes assumptions on what's important and disregards everything else. Your life doesn't depend on the ability to count how many books are here. But this is also how we could be tricked into believing something is real that isn't.
if this is a simulation, then someone is running it. The basic idea is that it's either aliens with absurdly advanced technological capabilities, or it's us thousands of years from now, and we're running this for whatever reason. Whether or not we are in a simulation would depend entirely on whether or not we can even be fully immersed in one. You might think that you experience the world directly, but it's indirectly. You are the central nervous system. Everything else is just a flesh shoe you wear around that allows you to move and experience the world. The brain itself cannot hear or speak or see. It is a blob of neurons connected to body parts that take in that sensory data for it. Hands touch and feel and send the information to the brain, which translates it and gives you an experience of reality. At the end of the day, the brain only needs input data to provide you with an experience. And it really doesn't matter where that information comes from. This leaves a lot of room for something else to step in. This is part of the idea behind Elon Musk's Neuralink. How it works is a small interface is surgically implanted into the brain and that translates and translates transmits the signals of the neurons to motor control so that eventually paralyzed patients could walk. The difference between Neuralink and this, for example, is that at the moment, Neuralink is just a one-way message system. Prosthetics and exoskeletons don't currently feel pain. This is a two-way device. It receives and sends messages. It is a fully functioning hand that feels the prick of a needle, so it's sending messages and also responds to Luke's mental commands. This is the kind of technology you would need to run a simulation. In 2003, Nick Bostrom published Are You Living in a Computer Simulation in Philosophical Quarterly, though he had been writing about it since 2001. This is considered to be the first serious publication of the modern concept of an artificial reality. At first, it wasn't taken too seriously, but once it entered the sophisticated halls of elitist academia, they realized that we actually couldn't prove it wasn't a simulation. So what are the odds that we're living in one? Well, not zero. <laughs> Many scientists and mathematicians put the odds at about 50-50. One idea to try and prove it is by finding the constraints. If we could push past them, then we'd find the boundaries and prove something was up. A glitch, basically. For example, we've measured pi out to about 105 trillion digits. As far as the application goes, it's a pretty useless number that far out, even NASA NASA only uses the first 15 digits, sometimes up to 37, but that's it. But if one day one of those numbers, 98 billion digits out, changes, that could be a sign that an error was accumulating in the program and something or someone had to make an adjustment. There are also some games in quantum physics that can be played, but for the most part, this is really difficult to prove one way or another. And yet there are reasons why it's convincing. For one, it could explain arbitrary constants in mathematics, like why couldn't this just just be a three. Why is there a speed of light? Why can't we go faster than that? And everything around us obeys these laws, so couldn't a computer just simulate that? Simulating an entire universe would be unnecessary. We're not in other galaxies, so there's really no point in creating all of that detail. You'd only need enough computing power to fool the inhabitants, us, and what we're directly interacting with. For example, you wouldn't need every cell or strand of DNA to be programmed. It would just have to be generated the moment someone looked at it. A simulation for 8 billion people would still require a computer to run trillions upon trillions of operations per second. One theory on how that might be possible is by harnessing a star, which could provide the power output necessary to run even multiple simulations. This is nuts, by the way. The materials alone would require fully mining multiple planets to nothing. It's just so beyond us right now. So what would be the point of putting 8 billion people in a virtual reality? Assuming every person is real. Maybe I'm an NPC. You don't know. I don't know. Why put a species through that? Let's think about our own use for simulations. On a math and science level, they're extremely valuable. We don't have to physically construct scenarios ourselves with time-consuming trial and error procedures. And then, of course, you have these kinds of simulations, the kind that create virtual realities for fun. The brain doesn't see or smell or feel. It's given messages from our body and interprets those messages into sensations so that you can experience the world. What's holding us back at the moment isn't the brain's structure, but our technology. Once the technology exists, 
this won't be difficult to do. Maybe that's why we haven't found alien life yet because it wasn't programmed. Or maybe the species that's running our simulation is also in a simulation they're not aware of. Or maybe we're doing this to ourselves because we've already destroyed Earth and the future versions of us are running this simulation to find a solution. Either way, you'll probably never know and that might be for the best.